Hello everyone, welcome to the Geoecologist. I am Dr. Krishnanand and in today's session, we are going to learn about the contribution of Greek scholars. In previous session, we learned about contribution of few Greek scholars and today we are going to continue the same. So it's important to learn about these contributions because this is going to be the building block of the concepts in modern period of geography. So let's learn about them. But before we go ahead, please like and subscribe to our channel and please press the bell icon for the updates. All right. So before we go ahead and learn about the contributions of other Greek scholars, let's understand these two important terminologies. One is called Hellenic and the other is called Hellenistic. What is the difference between these two? Many times when you start reading different books, you'll come across these two terminologies. So let me clarify this. Hellenic, which is related to Greek, refers to the people who lived in classical Greece. It means that part of Greece, which is older part, which is before Alexander the Great's death. That is about 323 before Christ. So before that, that is Hellenic. And Hellenic literally basically means very old, whose origins are not known clearly. So that is the literal meaning, but it basically signifies that the older part, the classical part. And what about Hellenistic? So Hellenistic is not Greek, but Greek-like, similar to Greeks that refers to Greeks and others, basically the Romans, who lived during the period after the conquest of Alexander. So Romans and other people, other civilizations who lived after Alexander, that is 323 BC, are supposed to be part of Hellenistic traditions. So Hellenic tradition, it means classical Greek tradition. Hellenistic tradition basically means that period after the Alexander's death. So let's understand it in terms of geographic influences. So Hellenic in territory basically means about geographic influences of the ancient Greece, the classical Greek. So contribution of classical Greek scholars, philosophers, religion and all those systems and political systems that changed from democracy to many small monarchs ultimately to be controlled by Rome were part of the later that is the Hellenistic traditions. So earlier system is Hellenic, later system is Hellenistic. So that is the basic difference. Now, let's go to the further understanding of the classical or Hellenic age of Greek civilization and further more contributions of other Greek scholars. So first one, we start with Socrates. So who is Socrates? He is one of the most famous Western philosophers and founding stones of Greek philosophy. So if you look at Socrates, he was one of the most exemplary and strangest of Greek philosophers. So his time starts from 469 to 399 before Christ. If you observe this, so right from the 5th century, when you say the classical Greek period, so his style of teaching was what is famous by the name of Socratic method. And why it is famous? Because it involved asking questions. So remember, he taught his pupils to ask questions rather than just accept what is given to you. So asking questions as a method of teaching and learning is part coming from Socratic philosophy that he inculcated into his students. That was interesting and he wrote nothing about himself. So who wrote whatever is there in this realm of knowledge? It was written by his students and his most famous student we know by the name of Plato. So Plato was his most renowned scholar and further Plato's scholar was Aristotle who taught Alexander. So that is a sequence coming in. So most notable scholar was Plato. So Socrates was accused of corrupting the youth because he was trying to create a revolution. And it was against those traditions, against the rulers of that time, that if you don't accept in a simple way, which is given to you, if you ask questions, it's supposed to be a rebellion. So Socrates was kind of a rebel of his time. He was a rebel teacher of his time who inculcated thought process in his students to learn more, to question that exists right now, to find more answers about what is there. So that was one interesting part in terms of Socrates and what he inculcated into his students we are going to see now. One of the most important scholar of Socrates that we know by the name of Plato. So he was one of the greatest philosophers and scholars that we know in the ancient Greece and he was founder of the first institution for higher education. So that's where the catch is, which was known by the name the Academy. 
So coming from the traditions of Socrates. Then further, in his work that is famously known as Timaios. So what is Timaios? It's basically distinction between space and matter. Now here comes the reasoning part. So he claimed that space is a distinct characteristic of matter. So spaces have characteristic which is made distinct by the nature of the matter that it has. And he argued that without matter, there is no space. So that is how he linked matter to space. Then in his argument, he speaks about the fact that we can only dream about empty space, what he called the primal substance. So one terminology that is important in Plato's construct of space is the primal substance, which is indirectly a virtual space. It's not a real space. It can only be dreamt about and it is gone when we wake up. So he talked about virtual spaces during ancient Greek era. Just imagine about this. So it was interesting about this primal substance. And furthermore, Plato says that the spatial characteristic has influence on the actual object. So spaces, it means a given space has its influence on the objects that are there or matter what is there as a constituent. So he devised the two pillars of understanding that we know by the state of being, the existence and its movement, how it changes, how it transforms. So that is the major contribution of Plato. Furthermore, Plato is regarded as the master or the father of deductive reasoning. So what is this deductive reasoning? It is basically when we move from a general to a particular. It means from a general mass, okay, we are going downwards and deducing to a point. So this kind of reasoning is still utilized by all fellow geographers, research scholars, scientists, isn't it? So it was wonderful thought that evolved during the Greek era coming from Plato as deductive reasoning. Then further, he also was one of those scholars whose idea was of round earth. So the idea of round earth became very famous, geocentric universe. This basically means the earth is the center of universe and which earth? This known earth during the Greek era. So this was supposed to be the center of the universe and all celestial bodies were supposed to be revolving around in a circular motion. So the motion was also defined. It was circular in nature. Then his disciple, was Aristotle, the famous scholar. And what was his contribution? Let's see. So he provided the first paradigm within the theoretical framework that existed in Europe that time. So the first paradigm of theoretical framework, the theoretical understanding of the events, the phenomena, the people, the cultures was given by Aristotle. He hypothesized and scientifically demonstrated very interestingly that Earth had a spherical shape. So the first scientific evidence of spherical shape of the earth is given by Aristotle and evidence was taken from the lunar eclipses that shape of the eclipse is coming to be in a crescent shape or different shapes which is resembling that that earth is spherical in shape so that was one idea which was through his observation further that's why he emphasized on the direct observation which basically means explaining something based on inductive reasoning, based on observation, based on uniqueness. So that's where the opposite of his teacher's advice, that is deductive reasoning by Plato, Aristotle devised his inductive reasoning, just the opposite of his teacher. So that was interesting again. And he advised his students to observe, go to the field and see for themselves, find out the truth. So that's where this statement that is go and see became famous coming from Aristotle. And where is it applied in our subject matter of geography? The field work. So field work is part of the core subject matter of geography and understanding because it has roots in greater forms of knowledge and understanding coming from the ancient scholars like Aristotle. So that was interesting part. Then further, he made a methodology of scientific explanation. So what is scientific explanation was explained first time by Aristotle that he formulated laws or fundamental principles of scientific explanation in which these WH questions, 
what, where, how and why was included. It basically meant that if you want to explain something scientifically, you must answer these four questions. So what is where, how and why? So this is coming from Aristotle's inductive reasoning and scientific explanation principle. Further, he put forward the concept of variations in habitability. So various habitable zones that is important. So latitudinal zones of habitability was given by him through his observation of the known world of that time. So he said that certain zones are non-habitable. If you go close to equator, you cannot live. That is very hot if you move towards down south. And if you go to extreme north, then also it is not habitable. So he explained habitable zones based on latitudinal extent. And that was interesting geographical thought that was emerging and coming in with scientific observable explanation. Then further, we look at his disciple who obeyed his teacher and actually wanted to see and conquer the entire world. As Aristotle said, go and see. So he was influenced at the age of 20 and he's called Alexander the Great. We all know him and his contribution is important. Apart from his conquests, it's important that during those conquests, if you observe this map right from the Greece to the western part of India, this entire area right from Macedonia, this entire part of land was conquered by Alexander. And if you conquer a land, definitely you will have lots of information and lots of knowledge gathering happening. So many historians and scholars traveled during those conquests and gathered historical and regional knowledge that is contributed to the regional and historical geographies. So that's where his contribution is there in terms of the knowledge that was gained and accumulated and finally when he established the city of Alexandria there a library was made and all those knowledge that was gathered was preserved. So what happened? There was a shift in the knowledge center from the ancient town of Miletus to the new town of Alexandria. So that was interesting. The next scholar that we see in this list is Eratosthenes. And he is known as father of geography. So he was supposed to be the first scientific geographer and also librarian where at the Alexandria library. So at that time period, people concerned with knowledge, its accumulation, its scientific explanation were considered as scientists, scientific geographer. We say that he was the first scientific geographer, although geography was not a subject matter, but the knowledge of geographies was important. So he calculated equatorial circumference of the earth to be about 40,233 kilometers using geometric techniques that was there. Then he coined this term geography. So before Eratosthenes, if you see this, before him, the word geography did not exist and that's why he is called father of geography. There is no other way that he could have been called father of geography, but he gave birth to this particular word itself that was geography. So it was description of the earth and the concept of scale for drawing the world map, the importance of spherical earth. These were the concepts on which he emphasized and furthermore, he gave this statement that geography that he coined was basically this. So this is the first definition of geography officially if you say that it was a study of earth as a home of man. So this is coming from Eratos Thines and his remarkable contribution was his great book that is Geographica and he also delineated the world into five climatic zones that's his major contribution. So one was Torrid zone two temperate zones and two frigid zones. So this is what was known to the world at that particular time period. And he also measured different latitudes and longitudes. And that's why he is considered as father of geodesy as well. The geodesic service that you study today is part of that Greek contribution that has come from Eratosthenes during those days. So rightfully he is known as father of geography. Now further, if we look at other scholars, so there were several more scholars whose contributions matter. One of them is Hippocrates. So his book was very famous in which he wrote about on airs, waters and places. This is the name of his book and he explained man-nature relationship which is core of the geography. So that was important where he linked the people and culture to the climatic conditions. So Hippocrates was famous for this. 
And then further, there was another scholar called Hipparchus. And Hipparchus is very famously one of the most important scholar in later Greek period for his contribution into astronomy. So he established the concept of the location of exact position of each place on the surface of the earth. So if you look at locational part in geography, it's coming from Hipparchus. He developed it and further using Assyrian arithmetic. That's when the pre-existing counts again. So using the Assyrian arithmetic, he divided the circle into 360 degrees and also he utilized a new instrument that is astrolabe. So what was astrolabe? It is looking like this particular image you have on your screen, the astrolabe. And he used astrolabe instead of Anaximander's gnomon because it was easier to handle, it was more comprehensive and it led to the development of various lunar and solar theories and also later part of his life he made a star catalog. So he was a well-established astronomer, the one of the best in the Greek era. Then another scholar, Posidonius, he is important because he categorized importantly the effect of climate on people. So he classified it in terms of geography of races. So just imagine how the races emerged and how they have formed and what is the influence of climate. In that particular time, he was able to take some inferences through his observation. Furthermore, he recalculated the Earth's circumference, which was earlier already calculated by Eratosthenes and approximately he calculated it to be about 18,000 miles. And furthermore, he also calculated the circumference of the Earth in a new innovative method using the position of this star, which is known as Canopus. So using the star called Canopus, its position and relative position, also using the rule of tangent, he calculated the circumference of the Earth. That's why Posidonius has another major contribution to be listed under Greek scholars. So now, when we have learnt about contributions of all the Greek scholars, we must understand that their contributions matter in the building of various concepts in geography. For example, physical geography as we saw, climatology, sedimentology, and apart from that, zones of habitability, and various other facets of geography that was covered by the contributions of the Greek scholars. So furthermore, we'll be learning about the contributions of Roman scholars in the Hellenistic period. So today we learned about the Hellenic and Hellenistic period terminologies as well. So see you for the next lecture. All the best wishes. Take care. Stay safe.